don't know, but I've been told Uranium ore's worth more than gold So I cad, I bought me a jeep I got that bug and I can't sleep Uranium fever has gone and got me down Hello and welcome back to the final episode of Project X, in which I am developing and building my own Geiger counter. In today's episode we will cover the Geiger counter module, discuss some safety precautions and I'll show you my written Geiger counter software called Radiation Monitor. Finally we test it with some spicy radiation. If this sounds interesting, stay tuned! First let's have a look at the schematic. After filtering the 5 volt supply voltage, it is fed into the famous NE555, which acts as a stable multivibrator to boost the voltage. It is a similar circuit as shown in my first episode. Here it converts the 5 volt supply to around 400 volts. It depends on the setting of the 100 ohms trimmer pot. After that we feed the high voltage into a Cockcroft Walton voltage multiplier to push it even further. The actual anode voltage depends on the Geiger tube being used. In my case it is a M4011. I separated the Geiger tube on an extra board so I can point it in any direction for various builds. It is important that the anode resistor R33 is as close as possible to the tube. Therefore it is located right on the Geiger tube board. The network of 5 additional 10 mega ohms resistors is there too. Those job is to give a high resistance measuring point. Since the circuit only delivers low current at high voltage, we need a fairly high resistance to measure it. Otherwise the voltage will break down. For instance, if we measure it directly with a multimeter. We pick up the signal at the Geiger tube's cathode and direct it into the base of transistor Q3. After that it goes into the Raspberry Pi Pico on the one hand and to the second NE555 on the other. The second NE555 is a pulse stretcher. It is only needed for peripheral use to make the pulse long enough to be audible via the speaker and visible for the LED. Otherwise the pulse would be way too short. Actually this isn't needed for my project, but I designed the board to have the option to use it as a standalone unit to see and hear the clicks. When it comes to soldering, there's nothing fancy going on, it's pretty straightforward. After finishing the PCB, it's time to set the correct voltage. Now I hooked up the counter module to my bench power supply and set it to 5 volts. You can see it draws about 6 mA in idle. Setting the jumper on the Geiger board is mandatory to measure the voltage. By the way, I am setting the voltage without the tube installed. Measuring 58 volts via the resistor network is just perfect. The real voltage is about 406 volts and is calculated via this formula, if we assume an internal multimeter resistance of 10 mega ohms. That's my finished construction of both PCBs. The benefits of this design is that you can mount the tube board in any angle. To prevent the Geiger tube connectors from shorting out when mounted to a conducting panel, I used PCB standoffs made of plastic. Here I am preparing the front panel for its final assembly. I already soldered all the cables and mounted the buttons, speaker and the VFD. Ok, it's time for the final assembly. The Geiger counter module goes right here, designed for expansion slot 2. For now I am closing the dust cover, since I am interested in gamma radiation anyways. Later I can open it again if I want to detect some beta radiation, but beta should go even through this tiny PCB material. I originally planned this unit as an environmental measuring device, which can also read the temperature, humidity and barometric pressure. Here the Bosch BME 280 sensor covers all desired tasks. And finally, after countless hours of work I've put into this project. It is all done, but wait, we need some software first. So let's take a look at it. 
For programming the software, you can either use the built-in editor, for which you don't even need a computer, or use the free MM Edit 5 as an IDE. It supports keyword highlighting and you can even upload your code directly to the Raspberry Pi Pico. The whole program is obviously way too big to explain every piece of code, but here's the general description. At the top, I declare all my variables. Even if you are not familiar with BASIC as a language, we all know this from C. After that, the Bosch BME280 sensor is initialized and we are greeted with the welcome screen with my logo. Well, the next step is to draw the chart. This happens in a sub-program I called Draw Axis Grid. Let's unfold this up to see what's inside. Basically, here is drawn the whole user interface and graphics, which is static, so to speak. The one exception is the auto-adjusting microsievert scale. The main loop is exactly what the name suggests. Everything inside continues to loop until the whole program is stopped. At first, it is checked if any physical button is pressed. <laughs> okay, and if an alarm is triggered, this block becomes active. It handles all the warning messages, sounds and also resets timers. The Geiger counter pulse is detected here. The count variable stores the actual counts and is reset every minute. The refresh bar sub gives a visual indication of the time left and the read keystroke sub takes care of any user input from the keyboard and processes it. After 24 hours a total reset of all variables happens. The next if block is responsible for the progressive drawing of the graph, since there are two visualization modes, 24 hour view and 144 minute view, it stores the new values, checks if the scale is maxed out, for example if newly detected radiation is greater than the previously used scale and finally draws the graph. At the bottom there is time, date and sensor data visualization as well as printing the data to the VF display. <laughs> ok, that's it in a nutshell. Of course we can unfold all those sub programs here and take a deeper look into each and every sub, but this would result in additional 2 hours of boring explanations at least. In my code I tried to comment everything, so you can get an idea of what's happening and of course if you have any questions feel free to ask. The mask you see here is from my former time at the armed forces. It is developed among other things to protect against radioactive particles. And of course you need to attach the right filter for that job. Bear in mind that there is no panacea in case of radiation. So better don't expose yourself to it. But since this is no option for today, we should talk about some precautions. Uranium mainly emits alpha radiation, therefore it can be easily blocked, but due to its decay products, it also emits beta and gamma radiation. On the one hand, as a radionuclide, it is radiotoxic, but uranium also has a chemotoxic effect, similar to lead or mercury. So better don't eat, touch or even inhale uranium. My today's specimens are glass, which contains uranium oxide, and a ceramic with uranium glaze and some pieces of uranium ore. My first two specimens are pretty safe to handle, since the uranium oxide is encapsulated, so to speak. But with the bare uranium ore it is advised to do not touch it by hand. It is crumbly and there is a chance of cross-contamination. And an alpha emitter in your lungs or in your mouth isn't ideal. As you can see, I am storing the hot stuff in this metal ammo can. This primarily is not to block all radiation, but to lock it up, preventing any person accidentally handling this material. For example, children or pets. But there is more to think of. One of uranium's decay products is radium and later radon. It is a radioactive gas. And you guessed it, the ventilation in both cases isn't ideal, so only open it in a well ventilated area. I've already done this before shooting this footage. I've put a white paper on the bench so you can see what I mean with crumbly. There are a lot of small particles and later we'll see whether they are radioactive or not.
we'll come back to that later. For now, let's power up the Kaiger counter and measure the normal background radiation. A few minutes left and we have an average radiation of 0.08 microsieverts per hour. Now I'm testing the leftover dust from the uranium ore. Even through the plastic enclosure it is definitely measuring some radiation. Let's wait some minutes to verify it. The radiation should go back to normal levels. And yes, it does. Testing uranium glass isn't really spectacular, but it glows nice under some UV light. I hope the uranium glaze has more to offer. And yes, it does. And now to the uranium ore. By pressing F5 I am activating the decay sound. <laughs> ok, this obviously has some potential. In a few seconds, due to the high radiation, we will see an auto-adjustment of the microsievert scale. There it is. Radiation levels detected. Warning. Hazardous radiation levels detected. Warning. Has Trying to block the radiation with a 2mm steel sheet plus a 5mm steel sheet doesn't seem to do much. Don't be fooled, the radiation does not get to low levels, it's just the small tube area which can't detect the nearby rays, since it isn't a focused beam. Ok, now I'm putting the box right onto the Geiger tube. I'm curious what the maximum will be. Ok, nice. Thirty-three microsieverts per hour. That's forty-one times the normal background radiation. I'm sure if I would take it out of the box and the back, I could push it even further. But I don't want any contamination of my Geiger tube. And in general, I designed this device as an environmental radiation monitor, not a portable Geiger counter. Let's talk about the key features. First of all, you can navigate via the cursor keys between the different measurements. If we want to know what's the exact value at this point in time, this becomes handy. With F1 you can set a calibration factor for your specific Geiger tube. You can also manually save an image of the actual screen via F2. And of course data logging is also possible. And if you like you can change the visualization mode to a 24 hour diagram. It is also possible to turn on the typical Geiger click. I called it DK sound in my program. With F6 you can set the alarm threshold and finally activate it with F7. Alarm activated. I thought it might become handy to be able to edit the title of your measurement. Let's say if you want to specify the location. And the setup menu allows you to set the date and time. The software is still under development and there will be updates with more features soon. I'll keep the download link in the description box updated. And I almost forgot to mention the additional possibility to read the temperature, humidity and barometric pressure too. 
Okay, that's it for today's episode. I hope you liked this little series and learned something on the way. Take care and auf Wiedersehen.